everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. If you haven't been following this channel lately, no big deal, welcome to the Ink Tank. But if you have, you'll notice I've just about reached the end of my classic Breakdown watch through. Believe it or not, we are on Ben's last casual adventures before all the big stuff that helps transition us into Alien Force. That's right, after this we have two special episodes, a two-part series finale, and then two TV movies. But this video's batch of episodes are the last ones that follow the simple, episodic format that the classic series is known for. The final small time adventures, where everything after is the big stuff. Next week, I'll be breaking down the episode Ken 10 with special guest star and great buddy opalo friend of mine, Kellen Goff, so stay tuned for that. But until we get to that, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all of my previous breakdowns, but by all means, stick around and watch this- <gasps> Fuck, I almost did it all in one breath this time. But by all means, stick around and watch this one first, I'm sure you'll still enjoy the video. Before we dive in, I got two quick updates. The first is from the last episode breakdown where I pointed out that the music used in Don't Drink the Water sounded very similar to the music used at the beginning of Race Against Time. I swear, it is, isn't it? It's so similar. Turns out, I wasn't going crazy. Although the first three seasons of Classic were composed by Andy Sturmer, the composer for Race Against Time, Damon Criswell, did in fact work on Ben 10's fourth season despite being uncredited. Which is why this season features a lot more rock orchestra heavy tracks than the previous three. And now, the results of the last poll. While temporarily enchanted by the Fountain of Youth, we got to see four of Ben's aliens as their younger selves. When I asked which one was your favorite, 58% of voters chose Baby Heat Blast. I also asked since Stinkfly had Stinky Fly, and Wild Mutt had Wild Pup. What would good names for young forearms and heat blast be? My favorites were Forehands and Heat Burn, both suggested by a few different people. Thanks for voting. Our first episode today is Ben 4, Good Buddy, first premiering September 22nd, 2007. It was written by Amy Wolfram, this being the first of three episodes that she'll write across the entire franchise. The trio help a highway driver whose RV was about to get robbed by the road crew. A group of car enthusiasts thieves who pick people's cars off of the highway. When a new highway is being built, the crew plan to steal the rust bucket and upgrade it to fire a missile that will destroy the highway so they can continue their criminal antics. And it's up to the Tennysons to get the rust bucket back. Another desert. A lot of episodes taking place in the desert. Don't you just love the open road? Not when you can't get a radio signal. You know how many times their radio has randomly gone off? And the rust bucket is connected to the plumber's global GPS. Could be two different systems. But this is one of those episode-only issues that the rust bucket has. Then how about a sing-along? We'll be... Gwen looks so mortified. Also, the smooth colors and gradients are really standing out in this episode, opposed to their old, grainy, textured process. And as the camera pans over to Gwen, she does get lighter. There's a lot of method to these gradients, too. Toilet won't flush again. Hydraulics on. If the rust bucket is that interconnected where the toilet somehow has to do with the radio and the horn, then I feel like the radio should also be interconnected with the plumber's GPS. But whatever. Aw, uh, this CG blending is a little rough. Going from Secret of the Omnitrix back to this is quite the jump. This thing can go 300 miles an hour, but it takes three people to flush? That's what I'm saying. Our old gal's got character. It's funny how the traditionally animated cars have more life than the CG one here. I think what really separates them is the lack of smoke coming from the rust bucket, and that you can't see the wheels turning, unlike these cars over here. Move that piece of junk! What's up with those drivers? They're going down! It's time for some real acceleration! It's a little distracting that when Ben looks down, his hand just pops into frame, especially in contrast to the movement of him looking down. See how it's kind of like... It's time for some... Just pops right there. It's time for Rip Jaws. Man. Maybe it's just the background animation, but it really doesn't seem like they're going that fast. This car here vaguely looks like Kevin's car. Count on me, boss. It seems like they all have this symbol somewhere too. Baron's got it on his arm, Road Rage has got it right here, and Turbine has hers on her arm right here. Also, these lanes are incredibly wide. If you can fit three cars driving the same direction on only one side of the road, doesn't look to be that way from this earlier shot. Leave him alone! <laughs> Looks like they're stretching the model a little bit so that you can see it wiggle a bit when it smacks the big truck. I was just about to say they're really getting a lot out of the CG rust bucket. But right here, it's back to being traditional. See, now that it's traditional, it gets those special driving vibrations that all the other cars do. 
This guy has the same face that I have when I'm editing at 3.30 in the morning. Jeez, look how wide the road is now. Oh yeah, I totally forgot Rip Joss was here. Got that cross style though. All right, I'm gonna try to cut back on the animation errors, but this episode is starting off with a ton of them. They're just all firing right out at me. Let's dial that back. Huh, all their cars are souped up. Rides over, freak! Jesus, this guy. I love that the swirl begins the same color as Gwen's magic, but then fades. Gwen's magic is what gets the air currents going, but then they could just start moving on their own. Oh my god, I just realized it's the wind spell from Divided We Stand, isn't it? Okay, it's not the exact same spell, but it pretty much does the same thing. I don't see why she needs two different spells just for wind. Hey, just wanted to record this extra little note. There's actually eight different wind spells, and as shown in Divided We Stand with the various Expectorium Perpetua and Turbo many times throughout UAF. These wind spells can have multiple uses, and it would have made the world building more interesting if we could recognize reoccurring spells used for multiple different uses, rather than getting a brand new spell every episode and never have any signature moves to go off of. What if Goku called his Kamehameha something different every single time? It just wouldn't stick. Wow, so that was all Gwen's doing. I'm thinking about getting me a different set of wheels. There's a monster in my hot tub. His RV is so much bigger than Max's. It's amazing in here. Yeah, holy shit. Although, how did these flowers not get knocked over during all that ruckus? Same with basically anything on these shelves. If you like all that fancy schmancy stuff. Well, you know, you can like both, Max. You don't gotta make a choice. It's not a monster. You try finding water in the desert. I almost had to eat a cactus. Pretty sure Rip Jaws can eat a cactus, no problem. How'd you, uh... The desert can play tricks with your mind. You're dripping all over his carpet, though, dude. It's the most advanced satellite communication system out there. But he didn't have any satellites, though. The rust bucket is the one with all the satellites, and it can't even get a signal out here. What's he got that state-of-the-art plumber tech doesn't? Wi-Fi, email, internet, and radio. <laughs> He says Wi-Fi, email, and internet as if those are three different things. Oh, that's the most 2007 trying to make the internet sound cool thing I've heard all day. This is still before the internet really took off and people actually understood what the fuck it was. 63 inch plasma with 500 channels of satellite TV. Okay, see, that's actually not bad. It's just we have so much better nowadays. But still, that's a pretty good setup, especially for an RV. It was time to cash in and see the country. Really get to meet people. Finally, relax in life. Oh man, Lawrence, let's Let's go on a trip. I could really use someone with your kind of company right now. Can I treat you to dinner for all your help? Man, this Lawrence guy is so kind. Egg rolls, chicken, corn dogs, hell yeah. Word around these parts is you took down the road crew. Actually, that was Gwen. They've been terrorizing good folks on these back roads since I had a full set of teeth. How are they not caught by the police? Took my ride years ago. Been stuck here ever since. Does she live at the diner or get a ride? I mean, having your car jacked sucks, but it's not like you gotta stay put the rest of your life. And they'll be out of a job once the new highway opens. No more sitting ducks on the road for them to pluck off. Got the best ice cream this side. Did he just bite that bone? Look at this. We got a full bone here. And then yoink. Here it is. Ben just bit the bone off. I'm trying to act like eating a cactus is so bad. Did he forget he was in human form right now? It's this soft glow around the wheels. Perhaps to help make them more visible. But it breaks the whole illusion with everything else in the car. The second you spot these, it's over. The illusion's ruined. Don't, Don't use, use the, the ice maker! maker. <laughs> that is a lot of ice for a fridge that size. <laughs> Holy shit. Man, Grandpa's dodging everything she's got at him. He just does a gentle shove and pushes her across the parking lot. How do these people function? Get out. So right here, they're trying to mask a 2D interior on top of the 3D rust bucket. And I admire the effort to keep the perspective a bit. You know, this could have been a lot worse. But after seeing the final result, it probably would have been best to keep the windows black. Oh, do you hear those heavy rips? That's an interesting sound. Hero time! Hey, hero time! Let's eat! I like that after you see the sphere form inside of his stomach, it goes up and out of his mouth. <laughs> what do we got here? Half the Omnitrix is glowing? I'm a bottomless pit, and I can't digest the good stuff! That would have been a great weakness for Upchuck if they went through with it. But then Alien Force changed that too. 
Man, Upchuck barely did anything. Come to think of it, neither did Ripjaws. Ben's been getting sidelined in this whole episode. And I'm gonna be ultra hot wax! That's terrifying. What? You know what? Whatever. Really cool that they made the wax sort of rainbow colored, because it really does look like that. Although the force of these things, if you get your arm caught in that, it's probably coming right off. <laughs> That must have felt awesome, though. I look okay. Oh, well, maybe if the hairline was a little lower, that would be a pretty cool hairstyle. Yeah, I can dig that. Uh, I look okay. Ooh, she probably tops out at 300 miles an hour. Wow, she was right. This thing can go 300 miles an hour, but it takes three people to flush. I want it ready for the highway grand opening. With the insurance money you'll get, you could buy something brand new. The rust bucket's insured? I guess it makes sense, but that's just weird to me. I don't know. The rust bucket's irreplaceable. It's got character. It has personality. And thousands of dollars worth of alien hunting equipment, not to mention evidence of all of your secrets. And you guys have no place to live now. It smells. It breaks down. And it shoots lasers. And has a grappling hook strong enough to hold a prison bus. Wainwright's letting me take it for a quick spin around the block. Really? Man, this guy is a little too nice. Kind of dangerous just giving out your ride like that. Especially if you're afraid of it getting stolen. <laughs> These fuzzy textures aren't so bad either. Might be tough to clean if you spill something on it, but I'm not against it. So this part's coming out of the window? Guess they can't use that window anymore. <laughs> That's a cool weapon. That could definitely come in handy, especially when they go fight the negative Ted later on. I think if they made the outline a little less thick, it'd probably blend a lot better, even with all the dull gradients on the metal parts. Help! We're being robbed! You are the help. It plays in HD, and he's got every game ever made. All right, both of those sentences were ridiculous for a multitude of reasons. This satellite can pick up anything. Police alerts, weather reports, roadside emergency calls. I mean, so could the rust bucket up until literally this episode. We're under attack near Cross Creek, headed to base 49. You know, since Baron is voiced by DiMaggio and so is this radio announcer, it's almost like DiMaggio's telling on himself. Lucky for you, I know a shortcut to Cross Creek. You say that, yet you're still stuck in this town. What did they do to her? Funny to see him stay in his gelatinous form and climb. That's quite the grandson you got there. Ben's really stopped caring about his secret identity this season. So here we see Upgrade crawl up the arm and then it just fades into the upgraded claw. Normally they do put in the effort to do a full morph. So something like this, I am gonna have to call out. Maybe a time constraint thing. I'm not gonna jump right to laziness, but it does look pretty bad here. Ah, oh, nice. Upgrade the whole train. It's cool that all the shading effects here on this box are also seen as upgrade goes over it. So you can still see him slightly matching the shape of all the cargo inside. Do these lasers have weight? They're shooting out like bombs. I'm not really getting the upgrade feel of him here. Wow, literal perfect timing. They would have had to always jump here no matter what. All right, now they're finally pulling out all the stops. It's almost like they could have taken them out this entire time. They're just some people with cars. Hey, missiles are gonna launch in 10 seconds. Oh, Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Missiles. Nope. So all of the Rust Bucket's faults still have an effect on the new additions to the RV? They're getting whacked with ice hurts. I don't blame them. Now take a seat. Oi, he's not gonna get that seat back. Wow. And the strength of her foot can keep her down? It's like the Tennyson's all just waited until, oh, okay, now I have to try. I like that you can see Road Rage's eyes and reactions in her glasses. What else on these roads? My RV? Okay, so I guess he didn't lend it to her, but he's still pretty nice not even saying anything about it. Oh, forgot about that part. You're not gonna say anything? Oh my god. They used his RV to help save the day and was like, well, sucks for you, I guess. The old gal's gonna need a lot of work. I got you covered. In order to do this, this must imply that Ben knows how the RV works from the inside out. You can't just literally rip off the pieces and expect it to be okay. 
So, I'm not gonna lie, I was actually excited to break down this episode because I remember not liking it a lot growing up, and usually I've been able to see things with a clearer perspective. Hey! And allow me to appreciate a lot of things about the episodes I might not have before. Whereas this kind of gave me the opposite reaction. I actually liked this even less than when I watched it as a kid. And I debated on this for a long time because I just didn't want to hate on this episode, but I really do believe the plot deserves a zero. This episode only characteristic about the rust bucket and everybody's general opinions on it being a crappy machine, and it has so many problems. It only exists for this episode. And when we're literally at the end of season four, almost with the series finale, you can't start doing this kind of stuff anymore. You can't just introduce these facts as if it's been true the whole time, not this far into the show. And just because we know what the rust bucket is capable of and all of the procedures it has, it's like, you know, one episode Grandpa had a remote that made the rust bucket automatically drive itself back. Who says we have to go to it? Why not just use that to get the rust bucket back? Why isn't there any plumber security procedures? Why were the police so incompetent to catch the road crew? Are the road crew also super geniuses, or are they just some people with some cars? There's a lot more I can delve in onto why the plot doesn't work for this episode. You could probably pick up on a lot of my opinions throughout the breakdown you just watched, but ultimately this just does not fit into the world of Ben 10. Ben 10 is not a racing show. I'm trying to make a whole car-centered plot line where the appeal is Ben turning into all of these aliens. You know, I hate to use the the word filler for an episodic show, but if this was gonna be considered filler, this is the wrong kind of filler. It's just very out of place, the motivations are all over the place, and none of the events in the episode really connect together. Characterization is gonna get a two. A lot of these characters just don't act consistently to the way that they usually have throughout the first four series. That might have to do with this being written by a guest writer, but even so, there's story editors that are supposed to correct this. It's passable if you're just watching this episode casually, but you know, Know, this episode was probably made for, but from the way I've been analyzing these characters through the first four seasons, they probably would not have handled the situation like this. And I almost find it ridiculous that they got away with stealing the rust bucket in the first place. As for a lot of the side characters, like, you know, Shelby, she was just supposed to be like the quirky side character of the episode. That would be the embodiment of the immediate society they're in. She just didn't hit the mark for me. The old woman is secretly a badass trope has been done so much to death, they're still doing it in 2021. I'm going old school on his butt. Let's play a game. Hate. Especially when a lot of other attention is addressed to the road crew, who also just seem as flat as they could be. Alright, I really don't feel good ripping into this episode. But like I said, come on, we are at the end of season 4. There are expectations set now for what we should get out of a Ben 10 episode. And this story just doesn't feel like a Ben 10 story. I want to say it feels like Ben got sidelined for this adventure, but I couldn't even tell you what he got sidelined for. Visuals is going to get another 2. Like I said, in a show about aliens and sci-fi, and magic, trying to put focus on a racing episode without even bothering to add some type of Ben 10 twist to it and just create some very uninteresting action in comparison to a lot of the other episodes. Not to mention this is definitely not the best animated episode out there. The character models were all over the place. The action didn't seem to flow correctly. And we've seen quite a few deserts in Ben 10 by now. And it's just not an interesting atmosphere anymore. Importance, it's gonna get that zero again. This doesn't build upon or expand anything we've learned prior and isn't brought up again in a future episode and this doesn't seem to have an impact on the Ben 10 fandom at all and entertaining it's going to get a one I'm sorry but I do feel like this is one of the most boring episodes of Ben 10 I felt that back then and I feel it now so this feeling kind of feels solidified that if you're in the mood to watch Ben 10 for what the show is this is not the episode to go with and that brings us down to a five out of 25 I'm pretty sure this is the lowest score I've ever given and you know if any episode was gonna get it, I guess this is the one. Our second episode, Ready to Rumble, first aired September 29th, 2007, and was written by Eugene Sun, the second of his episodes so far. Ben believes he accidentally broke Gwen's laptop and joins a wrestling competition as Forearms to win the $10,000 grand prize and buy her a new one. There, he meets two wrestlers that are after the prize money for their own safety, and Ben must choose which problems he wants to solve, his or theirs. <laughs> Has anyone ever tried this before? Like, is this a real activity? I can't seem to find anything online about it, but I'd believe it. People probably somehow find a way to do this somewhere. <laughs> does look pretty fun though. It's gonna take you forever to carry that block up there. 
Look at this extra gust of grass that comes up as he runs. Although right here on the edge, his speed trail doesn't fully connect, and his tail isn't entirely colored in. Presenting. Look how far his helmet curves down here. If you guys watch my breakdown about Accelerate episode, you'll see I make a point about how different Accelerate's head shape looks all the time. Him pushing off with his tail is cool to see. You don't really see him use his tail as an appendage. As any alien, really. Maybe Spider Monkey? Nothing significant I can remember, though. What do you think you're doing? Check out the new Sumo Slammer blog. Keeping up with his fan sites. Same thing I did at his age. Not without asking me first. That's my brand new- May I please? No way! Gwen made him ask even though she was gonna say no anyways, and Ben, ben still used it in the first place when he should have asked. They're just kind of arguing for the sake of arguing right now. <laughs> Whoa, have we seen inside their bathroom before? I think we saw a glimpse of this toilet from last episode, but I don't remember ever being in here. Ben, my whole life is on that hard drive! But she just said it's a new computer. I mean, I guess you could swap hard drives. But even so, doesn't she have a backup drive? Oh, man. Tough enough to be the champion? Prove it in the ring and win the $10,000 grand prize. This is where he gets the name Ben 10,000. Also, aside from this Captain America looking guy, this guy clearly has a tail and some other non-human features. So I guess the world is super open about aliens or at least mutants existing. Do you think this is because of Ben's exploits around Summer? Or Ben 10's world has always just been okay with mutants? At the start of the series, it seemed like Ben's society was a reflection of ours, where everything averagely not common is a big deal. But now that we're in season four, it's definitely gone a lot more the fantasy route. Hello, new computer. So Grandpa's in his pajamas, but the kids don't seem to be, even though they do have their own nightwear. Guess they didn't feel like changing. Also some funky stuff going on with his stripe here. For this frame, his fly is colored in, and then for this frame, the whole bottom of his shirt isn't colored in. It just flickers really fast though, can't really notice it. See like this guy, is he this big because of the exaggerated art style? Or in real life would you really see like an 11 foot tall boulder looking guy? This guy looks like Ultimate Alien Cooper. And budge the immovable object! Who is he voiced by? D. Bradley Baker, should have seen that coming. Forearms! No one seems surprised that he's big, red, and quite literally has four arms. Oh, this is a really dark shot. Stadium lighting really can be like this. Usually you don't see it this dark in cartoons. Where's my prize money? You have to beat everybody to win! Talk to Mr. Grady, it's his show. And there he is, how convenient. I want to talk to you. This is another one of those times where the beeping is taking forever. I like to think that maybe Ben can hold it in sort of yeah. in times where he really needs to. Like when he was fighting Kevin. No! <laughs> or when he had to run away from Lieutenant Steele. Don't hurt me! Hey kid, you seen a big red guy? Is he not phased by the fact he was climbing out of his dumpster? I'm his manager. <laughs> Dirty business, ain't it? All right, I guess he's encouraging about the fact he was going through the dumpster. As long as he's not arrested. Where did you find that guy? Oh, that's Rob Paulson, isn't it? Yup, it is. I guess that makes sense since Ditto appears later in this episode. <laughs> Okay, this guy is definitely a mutant or an experiment or something. Ow. Got him in one hit. This guy too, what is he? This is the most non-human characters have appeared on Earth in Ben 10 so casually. Poor guy, he's just an average dude and he's going up against the porcupine. Winners for this round, Game Boy and Porcupine! Am I reading this right? No food, drink, gook. Well, all right then. Bring him on. That's a cool move. Wonder if Pierce can do that. In this universe, E3 is called E7. So this has all been one night so far, and this must be immediately after the match since Ben's Omnitrix is red. Where's Forearms? Is he really trying to eat this kid? Jeez. What are you doing? He's just a kid! Yeah. A kid who manages the guy that kicked your butt. We scare him off. Maybe the big guy takes a dive. All right, well, if he was just trying to scare him, I don't know, that doesn't really make it better, does it? Okay, but these only would have missed if Ben dodged, so they're trusting that Ben is able to move out of the way, but still, if they're not actually trying to kill him, that's a really risky way to do it. Well, looky here. The freak show's come to town. Grandpa? Yeah, that is Paul Eiding. That's so funny. Make sure you understand what happens if you don't win. <laughs> I really like that voice, but I just hear Paul Eiding so clearly. That prize money's as good as ours. Don't worry. You should be if you disappoint Mr. Beck. Ben 
$10,000 grand prize! That's Rob Paulson too. Nice purple coat. Go to your corners and come out fighting at the bell! <laughs> he just gets ignored. Look at him. Go to your corners and come out fighting at the bell! And when they don't listen to him, he's like, well, shit. It's not like I can do anything to them. <laughs> Touchdown like the head zone. When the circle turn to my home, can't get me out of my zone. Go hard. Go hard. A go home. Against one. That's not fair. Oh, like somebody having four arms instead of two? Well, I mean, that's one way to look at it. All right, but drug-inducing quails isn't that a little cheap? I get the 2v1, but this, this is straight up cheating. That's not a fight. And he still takes them both out. He has a much longer neck in this shot. Usually his neck isn't this long until UA. Kinda wish your boy would've stuck around and take some bows, though. He really gave that check to this kid, no questions asked. No paperwork, no ID verification. Imagine if it was that simple. Well, after I buy doofus cousin number one her new laptop, I should still have some extra green left over for me. You know, with Ben's attitude, it makes it seem like he's doing something malicious, I guess, but he feels like he broke Gwen's laptop and is now trying to replace it. I feel like that's pretty nice. What was that all about? We got mixed up with some gangsters and owe them money. Or they'll kick us off our farm. It's crazy what people can get away with. They're holding our mama as collateral. Got me feeling bad for this big gator man right here. They don't even know where they're holding her. Isn't there some kind of old lumber mill around here? Good thinking, Ben. He really is smart when he tries. So this is a nice little switch from the dark to the light when the light turns on. Because it doesn't just change the color palette, it also changes the direction in which the light comes. Oh snap, here comes Mad Max. Here, now let her go. Well, isn't this a pleasant surprise? He's still gonna do it? Man, what an asshole. This guy's whole face is colored in the same way as his trench coat. Use some of your sleeping quills, dude. He could probably take them all out right now if he wanted to. Look at the way this guy lands and then forms something in his arms right here. He even holds it for a second. It's like he's about to fire a Kamehameha at him. Time to call in the champ. Ditto. That reminds me. So my other review in Ditto's first episode, I said he became a fan favorite after only one episode. I meant because after his first and only appearance, people already loved him. Not that he only appeared in Divided We Stand, because obviously he's right here. Although this is his last appearance in the classic series by Ben. The third and final time we get this alien is from Ken, which will be next week's review. It's a pretty slow sawmill. Oh, the split doesn't look that good right here. It looks like they're just walking out of each other's frames. There's no osmosis effect. How many guys do you manage? Ten. And counting. I like that he says and counting, because he does have more aliens. We're sorry, Ma. We thought we were doing the right thing. If only they thought of wrestling to begin with and didn't mix themselves up with the gangsters. I get everybody makes mistakes and you're not always thinking level-headed when you're desperate, but it sucks that there was a way out and they didn't see it till it was too late. The prize money? We can't take this. And he still hesitated about the money. This gator guy is pretty honorable, despite, you know, almost biting Ben's head off. Ooh, a red bush. Don't see too many of these. Grandpa, didn't you say the dishes were Gwen's job the other day? Young lady, you think those dirty dishes are just gonna wash themselves? So why is she sitting here doing nothing while you're doing the dishes? Morning, Ben. You're up early. Oh, right. This whole episode took place over one night. God, that's gotta be a busy night. You think you broke my computer? But I'm really sorry, and I'll make it up to you somehow. You know, I don't want to be surprised by Ben's empathy, but at this point, I am. Ben has gone back and forth about whether or not he actually cares about Gwen and her stuff. Although this episode, he does care from the start. The second he thinks Gwen's laptop is broken, he wants to do something about it. He's not like, oh, well, sucks for the dweeb. So I do like how straight they're playing Ben's concern for Gwen's things here. I just wish every episode, you know, had this type of progression. I could do all your chores for the rest of the summer. No take backs. Yeah, see? He goes up to the dishes and starts doing them after he said he would do Gwen's chores. Showing that the dishes are Gwen's chores, so why was Grandpa doing them? Give him a break. This man works so hard. Hey, what's that new doohickey, Gwen? It's a fingerprint scanner. Only I can start my computer. I didn't break it. Nope. Aw, oh, she duped him so hard. Guess that's revenge for all the other episodes. But in the context of this episode, it's kind of mean. Also, when this first aired, it got me thinking, like, if technology like that was even possible. Like, nowadays, fingerprint access is so commonplace. People do 
it to punch in at their jobs, people do it to unlock their phones. But when I first heard it in this episode, I thought that was just some sci-fi bullshit. I was like, there's no way you can unlock a computer just by scanning your fingerprint and look where we are now. And with that, we conclude Classic Ben 10's final casual adventure, which technically wasn't even an adventure, but just a nice little side story about Ben trying to fix Gwen's laptop. And you know, for a pretty basic plot, I will still give it a three. There was a solid story here, and unlike the last episode, it does feel like one thing flowed into the next a little bit more naturally. We started with one plot about Ben trying to wrestle for Gwen's laptop, and then transitioned into the saving the farm plot, but they both felt connected. I like how the whole episode was about Ben trying to do something nice for Gwen to make up for something that he felt was wrong. That was a very nice change from the opposite of where, say if this was like season one or two, or even three sometimes, how this episode would normally go is Ben would do something wrong and not care, and then have to have someone convince him to care, and then he'll try to make up for it. So this was a good change of pace. The characterization will get a four. Ben is written as a very strong character here, and the wrestling duo, Porcupine and Gator Boy, they are pretty good supporting characters, and they even get a little bit more backstory here. They're two mutants that live with their mom on a farm. The farm is starting to go under, so they're desperate for money, join a gang, end up owing money, and then wrestle to pay off the gang so that they can save the farm. I guess the only missing piece is how did they get mixed up with the gang, and what did they do while they were under the gang's influence? Like, what kind of crimes was this gang for? I don't even think we understood what they did in the first place. That's not really what the episode is about, and it does work without that information, but that little missing piece of information doesn't let you fully get to sympathize with them, because all of the gang stuff is kept very vague. And at the end of the day, I can't tell you what this gang even does. Just gang stuff, I guess. Visuals, it's gonna get a three. The wrestlers in this episode were very well designed, and the animation was pretty good. It just didn't have that special Ben 10 spectacle that a lot of other episodes that have gotten a five in this category have. Importance, it's gonna get another zero. As we're leaning towards the end of the series, a lot of the attention was probably put on the specials in the movie. That these ones are more inconsequential than some of the earlier episodes that would set up the world building. This is just one of the fun things that happen in between the save the day stuff. And entertaining, I'll give it a three. It's a nice basic episode of Ben 10. Nothing too wild happening here, but the plot is enjoyable enough. That leaves this episode off with a 13 out of 25. Let's go ahead and take a look at that roadmap. In Ben 4 Good Buddy, Shelby mentions that they are five miles down from Augustus. And due to the hot temperatures and long highways, this could mean Augustus, Texas. And although we're four seasons in, we still have episodes that leave us locationless. So until the negative 10 finale, this is where we're gonna leave the map. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the final conclusion. So real quick, Ben wins the $10,000 grand prize, right? And then he says, Well, after I buy doofus cousin number one her new laptop, I should still have some extra green left over for me. What kind of laptop costs upwards of $10,000 that a 10-year-old needs, especially back in 2007? Anyway, so when these episodes were airing, I was so caught up in the hype for the movies and specials that I didn't really realize how much the end of season four kind of sucks. But they were surrounded by such greatness that they're so far into the shadows of Secret of the Omnitrix and Race Against Time that it doesn't even matter if they were good. Nonetheless, I finally completed the bulk of season four, and now it's time to move on to the specials before I nail that Race Against Time review. But before I go, let's set up this week's poll. As we're getting close to finishing the Ben 10 Classic breakdowns completely, which breakdown are you most looking forward to for me to dig into? Ben 10, featuring Kellen Goff. Ben 10 versus the Negative 10 Parts 1 and 2. Goodbye and Good Riddance, the alternate timeline episode. Race Against Time, the first live action movie. Or Destroy All Aliens, the CGI revival movie. Make sure you guys place your vote in the community tab, but until then, you can stay up to date with everything that I do on my social medias and join the Discord for some community interaction. You can also join the Patreon for $1 a month, that's $12 a year, for exclusive weekly updates on everything we do, such as five years later and, and beyond. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and until next time keep it fizzy Ugh, god now i can stop pretending that i like this Ugh. Ugh. ben 10 Ugh. <laughs>